Hello again. All right. So apologies for the short break, um, but we want to make sure we get to our next panel, which is going to be equally as fascinating as everything we've seen already. Um, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Okay, and we're ready to go online. Our next panel will be hybrid, so we're go I'm going to start by welcoming up our discussant, Dr. Jacob Klein, a senior lecturer at SOAS at the University of London. Welcome, Dr. Klein. Great, thank you so much for having me here at this uh, fantastic uh, conference. Um, well, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, as said, I'm Jacob Klein. I'm at SOAS, uh, where I'm formerly uh, chair of the SOAS Food Study Center. And I also am director of an Anthropology of Food MA program. So thinking about some of the stats that we heard from Roy this morning, if you have any undergraduate students here in Michigan that you want to send to London, <laughs> get in touch. Um, so that was my, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, so we have three speakers on, on the uh, panel today, on this panel. Uh, the first speaker will be Jérôme de Witt, who is currently a visiting professor at the University of Vienna. Uh, he, uh, I'll, just, I'll just mention one publication from each of our speakers for today. So his he's a literary scholar, um, and to mention one of his articles, it's called the, the Cultural Creation of the Ethnic Korean Minority in China, focusing on the portrayal of local landscape uh, uh, in post-1949 Korean Chinese literature. Uh, our other two speakers are anthropologists. Our second speaker will also be remote, uh, Sonia Yang, uh, who is TT and WF Chow Professor of Asian Studies at Rice University. And she is the author of the 2015 monograph, Eating Korean in America, Gastronomic Ethnography of Authenticity. Uh, and our third speaker is here with us, actually, in person, uh, Dr. Chihun Kim, Kim, who is a lecturer at Rutgers University, uh, and her publications include Let Them Eat Royal Court Cuisine, Heritage Politics of Defining Global Handshake, um, which came out in Gastronomica in 2017. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to our first speaker, who is remote, uh, Professor De Witt. Yes, thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, good. Then I will continue. Um, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me to, uh, to this very interesting workshop. And uh, the thing that I will present to you today is uh, also indeed a work in progress that I've been working on uh, quite a bit, but I never really found uh, an avenue to get it published somewhere since, uh, as uh, the panel host already said, uh, I'm working mostly on literature and not with uh, food per se, but um, I found such numerous mentionings of uh, a particular piece of food uh, among the Korean Chinese materials that I was working with that uh, uh, I wrote a rudimentary paper uh, uh, quite a bit of time ago uh, for which uh, I never had uh, any purpose, but uh, this workshop really gave me purpose to it. And that's why I title it uh, The Significance of the Apple Pear to Korean Chinese uh, Cultural Identity. Um, let me have a look uh, how I can, Oops. Uh, I have to move to the next slide, but uh, I have to see how I can make that happen. Yes. Um, so representations about Korean Chinese uh, can be found on the internet, but um, they are very uh, much uh, essentializing uh, who and what the Korean Chinese are. So if you type in the Korean Chinese uh, in the Chinese uh, a Google, then uh, you will find uh, pictures, uh, as you see on the left, where uh, there are only women, apparently, uh, who are Korean Chinese. Uh, they're all wearing hanbok and they all can sing and dance uh, very nicely. But then when you go to the Korean uh, Google, the neighbor, then uh, the picture is quite different, uh, even though the pictures uh, that you see here are not uh, very clear, but um, there are often mentionings in the South Korean media, especially uh, about the violent nature of the Korean Chinese, and uh, they are 
uh, a very popular uh, villain in many of the gangster movies that you find. But uh, that is, of course, uh, luckily not how the pre-Chinese themselves represent themselves. And uh, uh, they talk about their identity usually in metaphors. And of course, the reason for that is that um, you are allowed to be a minority in China, but uh, you are not allowed to stray too far from the path and uh, openly discuss things uh, in very ethnic terms. So uh, for this reason, Korean Chinese intellectuals, they have often used uh, metaphors uh, such as uh, the ones that I list here um, to try to get around these kind of censorship issues. Um, and uh, the apple pear theory is, uh, I, I would say, the most popular among them. So there have been others uh, around, uh, like Chong Palyong's uh, Myon de uh, the daughter-in-law theory, in which um, it's the uh, Korean woman who is depicted as a Korean Chinese who is married uh, to China, a Chinese man. And because uh, of her traditional nature of having to keep the family together, um, she has the task to keep both families happy. So both uh, the husband's family, but also her own family, which is represented by uh, the Korean Peninsula. Um, however, um, it's especially in the late 1990s that uh, the Korean Chinese experienced uh, an identity crisis, a crisis of identity, and we're not very sure anymore uh, whether they uh, could depict themselves as a, as a diaspora. And um, from this time onwards, um, you will find in the late 1990s and early 2000s, many Korean Chinese newspapers where uh, Korean Chinese professors and other intellectuals are uh, fighting, uh, and uh, they indeed do not mince their words uh, often, about uh, what kind of apple pear the Korean Chinese are. So, for, of course, uh, somebody who's not really familiar with Korean Chinese culture and uh, their food, uh, this may seem very strange why these intellectuals are fighting over a piece of food, but uh, it, it uh, becomes clear if, uh, uh, if you see the quote from uh, Kim Kwan Ung, who says about the importance of the apple pear to the Korean Chinese identity as follows. Among the special food products of Yem Yen, there is dog meat, bear gallbladder, ginseng, pine mushrooms, todok root, Brecon, balloon flower root, and the apple pear. The apple pear is without question the ultimate product of Yem Bien, as the others are also found in other regions. So because of the uniqueness of the apple pear, the apple pear metaphor has been used in many cultural representations of Korean Chinese identity, uh, all the way from the uh, late 1950s, all the way to the present day. Uh, however, you will see that um, as time goes on and as the social situation and historical situation changes uh, among the Korean Chinese, um, that, um, uh, that they also give a, a different meaning, a different spin of uh, what the apple pear specifically means for them. And um, that is a, a, what I would like to do um, in this presentation to show how they go from um, using the apple pear as uh, depicting their uh, uh, presence in China as a model minority, helping out with uh, creating a new uh, socialist China, um, all the way to the present day in which the apple pear has the function of representing uh, their unique and uh, not a diasporic identity anymore, but a transnational one. Um, so in magazines, uh, you will find uh, often uh, these kinds of depictions where uh, women in Hanbok are uh, harvesting the apple pears. Uh, these are the pretty pictures you will find in many Korean Chinese ma magazines. Um, and uh, the first real mentioning of the apple pear you can find uh, in a popular song from the early 1960s, which is called Sawabe uh, Tan Antonio, uh, where um, some of the lyrics uh, go like this. Uh, Since our hometown is good, the apple pear also tastes delicious. Hurry up and get the Hebang Pet cars here so that we can load it with full with our sincere hearts and bring them to Beijing. So the song shows how the Korean Chinese uh, are harmoniously coexisting within China as a model minority and establishes the narrative that the Korean Chinese can add something unique to the rest of China. The apple pear is seen in the song as a positive symbol. 
first, the direct, direct connection is made between the people and the apple pear, um, where the, the apple pear tastes delicious since the hometown is good. Uh, and they also show how this uh, is uh, directly connected uh, to their mentality um, as a, a sem symbol that represents them. So the, the line uh, of uh, the Hebang Pe cars, the Hebang Pe cars at that time were uh, cars that were only used uh, uh, exclusively by the high officials. Uh, so uh, this therefore shows that uh, when they bring the apple pear filled with their good intentions, they will also let Beijing know that they are working for the benefit of the whole country. However, uh, it is not always the case that the apple pear is, uh, is used in this very positive light. Um, of course, the Korean Chinese have uh, also endured the hardships just like Han Chinese, uh, such as the Cultural Revolution uh, and what it wrought uh, in, in their society. And also for this, they often use the apple pear to show this negative, uh, uh, the negative side of uh, being part of China. Um, so uh, the apple pear here, functions then as a, as a symbol for the repression that they feel in Chinese society. And they especially mention that when they uh, put the apple pear um, in, uh, um, in, a, uh, in the light of uh, being planted in an inhospitable environment, but that even with such inauspicious beginnings, it endured the hardships and even managed to grow and thrive. Uh, and this is also seen, for example, in uh, a poem from 1993 called Chomok, uh, where you also see uh, this happening, where the, um, the, the earth and the soil uh, was not completely used for uh, growing an apple pear, but uh, they made it work anyhow. Um, and this is also seen in uh, writings uh, by Ruryon San, a famous essayist, uh, who, who died uh, like uh, five years ago, um, who also says that uh, from the earliest times, it was said that growing an apple north of the 42nd parallel was impossible. And when you, of course, go to Google Maps and search for the 42nd parallel, that's exactly where the Pacta Mountain is. So he makes a direct connection with uh, when the Koreans are moving away from the Korean Peninsula, then uh, nothing can grow there anymore, or the Koreans, they cannot find their roots uh, anymore. Um, and that is a, a common theme in uh, the writing the, of uh, Ruryon San. So in the um, uh, way that the Korean Chinese are using, uh, are changing their identity through the apple pear, you see that um, in the debate, they often uh, mention, well, the pear originally came from the Korean Peninsula. It was then mixed with uh, a Chinese apple and that uh, created this unique fruit that you can only find in Yimbian. Uh, however, the debates uh, that the intellectuals then uh, pursue in the late 1990s is to establish whether uh, the Korean Chinese are more Korean or more Chinese or whether they uh, are something else altogether. And in this debate, you see that uh, as time goes on and as the debate goes on, that they start to use the apple pear not uh, in a more dual relationship with uh, the Korean Peninsula and China, but um, to really set it apart uh, from both countries and create an autonomous and unique identity uh, where um, they um, uh, criticize uh, a society that is dominated by Han Chinese um, and the apple pear ser therefore serves the purpose of uh, escaping the harsh censorship rules uh, on the freedoms of expression uh, that they have if they want to um, express their own identity. Um, and that is also seen in a, a movie that came out in 2015 uh, called Saga Be Sarang, The Love for the Apple Pear, in which uh, again, um, like the main character um, is uh, helping uh, his grandfather uh, taking care of the apple pear trees, uh, but he has to make a decision in which uh, he's not exactly sure whether he should put, pursue a career in Beijing uh, or whether he really should till the fields, uh, even though it will not maybe bring a, a lot of money. But eventually he decides that uh, his um, original traditional identity is more important. And uh, at the end, he indeed uh, takes over the business of his uh, grandfather um, and this is seen uh, 
um, in a very positive way because the, the love interest in the story, she originally could not decide on uh, who to choose, but uh, she chooses the idealistic char main character in the end instead. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the creator of the uh, apple pear uh, 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 metaphor, uh, Hong Yong Chor, um, he actually is uh, much less positive about um, what Korean Chinese identity will change into. So he uh, says this in one of the essays that he wrote as follows. It doesn't matter how pretty the shape of the apple pear is. If it is bumped just a little, it will get bruised very easily. In the same way, the culture of the Korean Chinese minority is a separate variety created from Korea's traditional culture and Chinese culture. It is therefore not completely Korean, but also not uh, completely Chinese. To the Korean Chinese themselves, Korean Chinese culture is something precious. But there is a big danger that Korean Chinese culture will become swallowed up by Chinese culture. Therefore, just like with caring for a fragile baby, we should see to it that our culture will not fade away in an instant. So he is of a much, uh, he's uh, still trying to hold on to uh, a unique diasporic identity, even though you see that in uh, the writings uh, and in the way that the younger generation pursues their identity, um, they don't uh, see this diasporic identity as that important anymore. And instead pursue a much more uh, transnational one where the Korean peninsula um, still has some place, but it doesn't have the very important place that the older generation puts on it. And uh, therefore, they will also not uh, make use of the apple pear identity uh, as much as the older generation uh, of intellectuals are doing. So we see that also um, where, um, like Cho Min Ho in his poem, uh, for the Korean people living distinctly in China, this peel of the apple pear surrounds them like a film. At first sight, you might think of it as a red bruise in my heart, but only when it is too late, you will feel it was the cheek of a Korean Chinese woman. And in the rest of his writing, he also uh, hints at this uh, unique identity where uh, the Korean peninsula and uh, having been hurt by uh, the discrimination that they faced from uh, uh, in South Korean society actually made them realize that uh, they have something unique uh, going on and uh, that they can let go of uh, uh, the Korean Peninsula and in this way of their diasporic identity. And this also uh, features a little bit, uh, and this is the last example that I will use, in uh, one of the writings uh, from Yu Yon San, where he uh, creates uh, this very uh, interesting history where he uh, goes through Yembian and uh, searches for uh, remnants of the Parhe kingdom. Um, and he then also makes a link between the Korean Chinese living there now and the Parhe for, who for him are also Korean uh, living there uh, many years earlier. So he says, it is said that also in Parhe times, there was an abundance of pears growing here. The Parhe pears are being produced on a large scale in several places within Yemen. The only thing that has changed is that the apple and the pear have been combined and have now changed their name to apple pears. So what he's doing is that he um, uh, kind of appropriates the uh, history of uh, Pare uh, for the Korean Chinese, so that the, uh, the Koreans on the Korean Peninsula or the Chinese uh, cannot make use of it. And he especially mentions uh, that the Pare people uh, were uh, mingled uh, ethnicities um, and that therefore they created some sort of a unique kingdom, a unique identity for themselves. And that should be the message that uh, the younger generation should also take. Uh, and I think that's very interesting um, where uh, the apple pear functions as, uh, as this creator of a unique Korean Chinese identity where uh, the Korean Peninsula and also the efforts of the Han Chinese to um, uh, to dominate uh, the Korean Chinese culture um, are kind of set aside and uh, they see, they find strength in uh, this image, this metaphor of the apple pear um, in um, holding fast to and creating a new identity. And that's it. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to uh, receiving a lot of criticisms and questions from you all. Thank you.
So thank you very much, uh, Professor David, for a lovely paper. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Professor Sonia Yang, also online. Unmute myself. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Let me see. Sometimes I have. Uh, I make such a really basic error. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, gosh, it's a little weird that I'm here and not seeing the actual audience. But um, well, my paper is about uh, kimchi diaspora. I could have called it transnational kimchi. And then I don't know why I'm calling it diaspora at this point yet. I'm still thinking about it. But I felt that there was something about calling kimchi diaspora, people that were dispersed. And oftentimes, of course, the original Jewish um, the notion of diaspora is because it, it was God's punishment and then dispersed Jewish people all over the world with the hope of, you know, someday we will return. I'm not too sure if kimchi has um, <laughs> such a desire or kimchi has a home to return to. So I'm still, you know, this concept of kimchi in diaspora is still very much a work in progress kind of concept. But um, initially I wanted to think about kimchi, um, well, using kimchi, what can we no. But before that, writing about food to me, for me, is still, it continues to be a challenge because, you know, in, the, in, in classical epistemological idea of empiricism, we see something, we register it visually, and then that goes into your brain, and then it comes out in digested form in language. This, this, um, <laughs> I can see my my hand moving. Sorry, this this picture doesn't work in when we think about food because when you eat, this is this will be multi sensory experience, not just seeing, but you smell it, you taste it, you chew it, and you swallow it. It's um, it's a really um, when you think about it, it's almost like magical thing. How can we even write about food or your eating experience? And what else is involved? Can we even historicize it? Can we locate it in, in terms of, say, um, and even relations of power that transpired in all periods of human history? What does the story of kimchi tell us? Because these are the questions that really inspired me to write this paper. Um, so I don't know. Um, well, you don't have to know, but I studied my academic career as anthropology professor at Johns Hopkins University. And then that's when my mentor, Sidney Mintz, was um, was still alive. And then sadly, she passed recently. But um, as you know, his, his the most influential book was Sweetness and Power, where he traces the uh, history of sugar and then transatlantic slave trade. And it has a lot to do with emerging industrial revolution and working class poor, very poor, malnourished working class in England. And then what the role, what kind of role sugar played. The this transoceanic and transcontinental movement of sugar really uh, cap captures the um, imperialism, colonialism, and class stratification and unspeakable exploitation of human labor by a very small handful of humans, powerful humans, exploiting vast, vast number of humans that are completely made powerless. Does Kimchi's story tell such a, such a thing? I'm not sure. But I do think that the story of Kimchi still carries, bears, quite a bit of traces of uneven relations of power. So uh, for example, um, I'm sorry, I missed the uh, morning papers, but I was very interested in that, how Chile got to Korea. That, but anyway, I'm sure, and I hope we will be able to discuss in the, in the during this conference. But um, so Chile paper, of course, the, and I'm, I apologize if there was any overlap with this, um, what I'm gonna say. Um, 
reaches Korea, it, you know, it reaches Korea through Japan, and then it reaches Japan from the, through the uh, Iberian missionary activities. And then missionaries themselves did not work on the ship. That means they, this new, new world crop, chili, pepper, most likely came from the working, enslaved native South Americans. And so, um, yes, the, given the brutal nature of Imjin Weran, the, 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 you know, the Japanese Toyotomi Hideyoshi's, um, Toyotomi Hideyoshi's invasion of Korea in 1592, the, you know, the thing is Japanese. And along with the uh, more more recent colonization of Korea, things Japanese were seen with a lot of hostility and animosity for a long time in Japan, in, in Korea. So it's a kind of you know the ro robbing ro rubbing the uh, Korean <laughs> sensitivity in the wrong way. If you were to say current red kimchi in Korea actually could not have been born without Japanese invasion, um, but that is the case, and. But of course, that doesn't, oftentimes the origin of it doesn't necessarily play much role when you think about the authentic identity of certain thing, nation, or person, because ultimately it is up to the, the user or agency of the, um, you know, the appropriate or claimer of that authenticity who, uh, you know, that, that actually works, that actually is, becomes more important. So if South Korean government is so big on claiming kimchi as Korea's own and nobody else can have it. Um, well, that's probably okay, but that also creates a lot of problems for Koreans themselves because even though once a food item crosses a national border, it becomes authentic national food maybe because as you can see in America, um, there are many authentic Korean or authentic Korean and Japanese, or authentic Japanese restaurants. Well, is there such a thing as authentic Korean food? Because if you go to Korea, you know, restaurant A might be competing with restaurant B in the same street, and then A will insist that our recipe is multi-generationally trans transmitted, authentic, secret recipe. No one else can replicate it. That means we are the only authentic Korean food of this particular thing. So in um, domestically speaking, there are so many, you know, regions and chefs and individuals and moms insisting on my authentic recipe. But all of them, once crossing Korea, crossed Korean border, becomes authentic Korean food. And this is the reason why um, Sydney Mint said, there is no such a thing as authentic national food, although there are many regional foods. But then again, there's another more, let's say, fundamental challenge when we think about authenticity of food. Because even the world's most famous chef cannot cook two, you know, identical things twice because cooking, <laughs> the act of cooking itself is creation one time creation. So does this mean each time this is authentic? Then why do we even call it authentic recipe? Because the idea of recipe is already strange when you think about it, because it is to create something that is original many, many times. Just like in, Benjam in Walter Benjamin's um, idea of, uh, you know, the, the, the mechanical reproduction of art in the age of, um, you know, the, in the age of art, in the age of mechanical reproduction. So if there is an authentic original, and if you can create it, recreate it as many as you want, as many times as you want, because, because there's this thing called the recipe, is this really authentic? So that's uh, that to me is a kind of conundrum of thinking about codifying authentic kimchi recipe. I mean, I don't think such a thing exists, but whether, you know, whether something is true or not, sometimes it really doesn't matter. In, in fact, many times, oftentimes it doesn't matter because what, what you think to be true may be something entirely unrelated to, let's say the objective, if there is such a thing, object true truth. So for example, in the, in the US now, you know, the very close to the midterm election, half of the country believes in something. Like for example, January 6th, you know, 2020 was the righteous, righteous um, protest against rigged election. Half of us think that that's not the case. 
these are insurrection. These are, they, they, they don't understand how democracy works. For both these groups, they have truth, you know, in their own ways. So sometimes, sometimes you know, insisting on authenticity, I'm sorry, uh, am I going too close to microphone? Uh, doesn't really matter. It really, what matters is that how the actual user or the uh, owner or enactor of that notion uses it, understands it, and appropriates it, I think. So um, in that sense, we can, well, I'm tempted to say, well, it doesn't matter whether Korean government insisted or not. If they say it is authentic, it is authentic. Maybe. But I smell there is something else. If we, if we were to say some government insists on certain things, okay, let them have it. It kind of hides many things, such as what kind of uneven relations of power go in there? What kind of political calculation is in there? What kind of global, um, you know, the power in the relations of power is actually reflected in that? And in, in terms of Korean Peninsula, it would be interesting because I think um, uh, Chi Hoon's paper is about that, how North and South insist on authenticity of their kimchi, for example. So this is uh, my other, that was my other uh, concern when we think about, when I think about kimchi in diaspora. Now, thirdly, I am um, interested in the way ethnic food like kimchi comes in a wrapper of timelessness, healthfulness, and goodness. Is this an effect of Orientalism, including self-Orientalism of some sort? And as if, you know, kimchi, something like kimchi, is, it's good, it's, it's healthful, it's happy, it's authentic. And you know, the behind thinking that this exotic, good, interesting food, if we didn't follow the actual, you know, doings, the workings of different stakeholders and also environmental factors or even historical factors, what are we missing here? And above all, is there really such a thing as health, you know, science of kimchi? like many South Korean um, state-sponsored scientific institutions insist that their probiotic effect and um, other benefit of fermented food, especially kimchi, is really beneficial. But if you look at statistically, if you look at the stomach cancer occurrences, for example, South Korea ranks third in the world. It is a you know, really high occurrences of stomach cancer. Is it, is it related? So I'm not sure. These are the, these are the still concerns that that still bother me when I think about diasporic kimchi. Now, my other other thinking about the, my other concern thinking about kimchi is that how do we write about kimchi's flavor? Again, this goes back to my epistemological challenge of the uh, that, that I mentioned early on. That how do we actually write about something that you, one, you know, my, I myself experience, such as by eating, by tasting, and then turn it into words? Are words the best thing to convey? But in our current scholarly activities, that's still seen that, that you know, words still have currency. Although, yes, we do have YouTube videos and so on and watching and so on, but still, it, there are still, you know, there are words involved. You have to talk about it. You know, in, not just you have to write about it. So I'm concerned with this idea of you know wars and sensory experience. Do they converge? What I write about, you know, does, does the, do what I write about kimchi? Does it actually really represent kimchi or experience of eating kimchi? I find it very, very challenging. And it continues to be my um, big cha challenge because when we convey eating, tasting, and even swallowing in, in wars, what gets missing and what gets added? It's a, it's a continuing conundrum to me because even just a simple, so-called so simple description is not so simple when it comes to you know, writing about eating. So these are the background to my paper. In my paper, um, I briefly um, introduced the uh, kimchi jar that I encountered in Oklahoma gas station. Um, I did not expect to see that. And um, it was a bit of a surprise. 
And I felt really sorry when I left that kimchi jar without buying it. Because who's going to buy it? Or maybe, maybe there is someone who's going to buy it. I couldn't tell. It was such a strange experience to see kimchi. It was almost like when I first went to England to study in 1980s, it was still very rare to meet Koreans, Korean students studying in England. Um, I'm from Japan, but my parents are Korean. So when I met Korean students, for them, I was a strange, um, <laughs> strange element that was from Japan, but spoke Korean with heavy Japanese accent. And my vocabulary was North Korean <laughs> vocabulary. So it was a really strange encounter, but that encounter, some primordial encounter that of all places, in England, where you know everybody's of course speaking England English, and but I encounter a Korean person. It almost felt that way when I saw that kimchi jar in Oklahoma gas station. Please, I'm sorry, I don't I don't mean to insult Oklahoma. It's just that I don't want to make a family stop in Oklahoma when we do the uh, road trip. And um, so, so starting from there. How does kimchi reach here? How you know? How does such a jar of tiny kimchi, you know, reach Oklahoma gas station? And of course, it was a product of USA, so somebody in the US made it. But I discover in my in my paper, as you can see, that the um, kimchi factory in the US is rather novel thing, as opposed to kimchi factory in Japan. Japan is another very interesting story. It has offers very interesting story of kimchi because in Japan. As you, many of you know, things Korean were looked down upon severely <laughs> for a long time until recent um, Korean wave of pop music and K-drama, K-cinema and so on. Uh, things Korean was inferior. Koreans were also labeled as quarrelsome, simplistic, and doesn't have really good brain, inferior people. Of course, it reflects colonial um, discourse and colonial image making deliberately done. And um, as such, kimchi didn't penetrate Japanese tables until um, around 1970s. And it was also kind of slow going until it saw really explosive um, popularity in, you know, in, in the height of Korean wave of, let, let's say, 19, late 1990s and in 2000s. Now, kimchi is one of the most popular food items in Japan. And then not only that, housewives would love to make it. They find make kimchi making fun, interesting, um, very different from what they normally would make. And um, so they, you know, they, not only the, um, the there are books, but also there's a TV broadcast of kimchi, um, how to make kimchi class, for example. So this is such an interesting thing, if you think about it, because this, in some ways, this story of kimchi in Japan offers um, happy, happy, uh, you know, end results of food item overcoming ethnic prejudice. Is that, is that all <laughs> it offers? Or if we think about it in that, in that way, is it going to hide something? What is involved? What are, what are the actual relations of power? What is the role that, that is played by Koreans in Japan? Because there are so many Koreans living in Japan ever since colonial period. And then now the, their demographics are changing because of the new coming uh, immigrants from South Korea after 1990s. So how do we actually discern all of this? And that will probably take us quite away from kimchi itself. We'll probably have to look at the, um, the, you know, the food related laws and um, you know, the FDA equivalent in Japan, and then how come that the, um, you know, what is the import and export ratio and so on, and tourism, of course, all of that is going to probably have to go in. I couldn't do all of that in this, you know, for this conference paper, but I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that we will, again, definitely have to look into and even relations of power historically generated and how it, how the, this kind of uneven relations of power is maintained. What kind of laws, what kind of culture, what kind of language sustains this um, backstories where that will put kimchi in the, you know, the supermarket store and the shelves of, of, of Japan. So these are the, um, uh, 
I try to figure out when I think about the um, you know the kimchi as diaspora as as opposed to kimchi as transnational food. Again, this is a very work in con uh, in progress kind of concept. I don't know if there is any good um, reason why call it kimchi you know in diaspora as opposed to transnational kimchi. I'm not sure, so I would like to you know. I'm, I'm hoping that I will get quite a bit of feedback on that and so that I can develop this paper to towards a you know a little more advanced version. Okay. Um is this an okay point to stop? Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Sonia. Absolutely okay. perfect timing. Thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> Your lovely paper. Well, thank you so much for another wonderful paper. I think there's so many uh, interesting uh, convergences and also divergences between uh, the papers we've heard uh, this afternoon um, and also a lot of resonances with the papers from earlier today. Uh, so there's lots to talk about there. Uh, let me just uh, say a, a couple of things about uh, the format of the discussion as I've imagined it anyway uh, before, we, uh, before we proceed. Um, first of all, I should say that because the last panel ran over, we have been given license to also run over by about 10 to 15 minutes. So we'll try to finish by about 10 past four or quarter past four. Um, secondly, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, offer some comments uh, to all three papers with a few questions embedded in those as well. Um, and I'd like to ask the uh, paper givers to just each think about one thing in my comments or questions that they want to respond to. Just one thing. Um, that way we'll have more time for audience uh, participation, for everybody to participate and ask, ask their questions. Um, but I have flown in all the way from London uh, to be here, and I'm really, really happy to be here. So I'm going to um, bore you, I hope not, um, with some of my uh, various uh, comments. So um, bear with me. Right. OK. So. What I want to say a little bit about is the way in which um, I want to talk about three dimensions of the ways in which food can be used as symbols of national and cultural identity uh, that I think is brought out very nicely uh, in all three of these papers. Uh, the first dimension is that of food and power. The second dimension is that of self and other. And the third dimension is that of materialities. And all these will be very familiar to the anthropologists in the room and no doubt to many others. Uh, now, so to begin with uh, food and power then, I think uh, Professor Young uh, very usefully uh, began her, her talk with um, and her paper with uh, Sidney Mintz's Magisterial Sweetness and Power. So that book, as she was talking about, is fundamentally about the relationship between power and meaning. And for Mintz, to simplify, uh, greatly. Power is largely a question of structural power, the power of the political economy on the one hand, um, and its relationship then to people's practices and the meanings that they make uh, of those practices on the other hand. So the fact that certain foods could become markers of national identity or simply stand for something like the good life or the bad life even, um, these things are always constituted in and embedded in relationships of unequal power. Um, and all three papers, I thought, really bring out uh, this kind of power meaning uh, complex. So Ryang, uh, obviously, in relation to diasporas in particular, and their conditions and experiences under different regimes, be it under Japanese imperialism or global capitalism. Uh, Kim, Dr. Kim, in relation to state projects aimed at fixing meanings and practices of kimchi through these, um, and so looking at and, and you know looking at Korean national identity in both North and South, uh, and Devit uh, connects meaning and power insofar as he's looking at the way in which state power um, uh, ref uh, shapes the way in which a particular uh, minority group with a very precarious relationship to state power, attempts to negotiate that through particular symbols, in this case, the, the apple pear. Um, and, but I do have a few questions about this kind of power meaning relationship uh, for possible further uh, discussion or consideration. Um, first of all, in relation to uh, kimchi, I wanted to know more 
from both of the uh, papers on, on kimchi about kind of more specifically and concrete about the relationship between the forms uh, and meanings uh, of, 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 of kimchi in relation to power. So, for example, if sugar, as Mintz wrote, was a proletarian hunger killer that fueled the Industrial Revolution, has kimchi in some sense also fueled the Korean diaspora in Japan and elsewhere, perhaps not by providing cheap calories, but providing crucial comfort uh, and, of course, crucial nutrients. Um, Secondly, I would like to know, and again, this speaks to Professor Yang's paper, but others might have something to say about this as well. I'd like to know more about this shift going on in Japan from a kind of despised food of colonial sub, from kimchi as a despised food of its colonial subjects to an apparently domesticated food, domesticated food and Melissa Caldwell's food of something which is so localized that it no longer, that it ceases to be exotic. It's something part of, it becomes something part of everyday life. Uh, and, and has this happens in the post-colonial era, especially since the 1970s. So can we see this, and this maybe ties into what uh, Professor Kang was talking about earlier today, can we see this actually as a form of subjugation? Uh, is this about, in bell hooks terms, eating the other, about incorporating cultural forms of racialized others into the self, and of course simultaneously taming these in some sense, and in the Japanese context, to a milder Japanese taste, and so on. So, um, and can, might we even see this as a form of cultural appropriation, um, which is a term which has come up also earlier in today's um, uh, 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 discussions. Uh, is it the Japanese equivalent to Britain's tikka, chicken tikka masala, for those of you who are familiar with that? Okay, um, and does the Japanese version, kimuchi, still actually, like a lot of curries in England, still carry a kind of residual sense of Koreanness that might actually be brought out at certain moments and become the focus, once again, for denigration or even violence. Right? Um, a second question I have there in, in terms of uh, this kind of power meaning nexus um, is thinking about kind of heritageization and top-down heritageization as a particular form of power. And it's very interesting that uh, Dr. Kim is really, in, in very interesting ways, quite um, positive about something which is often talked about in terms of UNESCO side, as for as a term that many of you have heard. This is a very different version of that. I was very interested by that. Um, now, Kim refers to this, uh, to this kind of um, heritageization in, in a couple of places in her paper as a form of ownership um, in terms of over the definition of kimchi authenticity. Uh, and a crucial context for that, a background to that, is the attempt to protect Korean producers from competition, from Japan and China in particular. But I wonder whether ownership is really the right term to use in these contexts. And, uh, and I think Professor Yang used, it, used the term as well in, her, in the written version of her paper. So does, um, what kind of ownership does UNESCO intangible heritage status really confer? So it's, I think it's interesting to bring out the kind of relationship there between, between in, intangible cultural heritage on the one hand versus the Codex uh, Alimentarius, which actually does set standards of global trade under the WTO, um, or national, uh, or for example, European Union level uh, geographical indication schemes. Um, so I, I wonder whether actually in, in, in some sense, kind of UNESCO intangible cultural heritage status actually may have the kind of almost the, the, the opposite effect, really. Not really a protect, protecting con Korean con uh, producers at all, um, but actually opening it up to a number of actors who also may, uh, uh, might want to draw on the symbolic value of heritage, of Korean heritage for various ends, uh, be it Koreans in the diaspora, who might use this as, a, as an emblem of pride, pride, or of Chinese or other kimchi companies who may use its now officially globally recognized association with Korea to in fact add value to their products. There's nothing stopping them really from doing that, right? Um, and, and in fact, I mean, arguably, geographical indications often tend to do this as well in practice. But I think maybe, and we can see this, I was thinking about, there's, an, there's a Mexican restaurant in London now who actually explicitly draw upon this uh, UNESCO uh, uh, certification of, of, of Mexican cuisine as intangible uh, cultural heritage of humanity in the way that they represent their restaurants and so on. Of course, those are then, uh, you know, uh, judged by eaters and others, but still, it's interesting to see how that happens. Um, in terms of, I also have a, a question for Dr. Prof uh, Professor, Professor Duvit uh, in terms of this whole kind of um, power nexus uh, 
uh, relationship. And I, I, one thing that struck me is the continuation of different forms of power under different kinds of political regimes. Uh, so he seems to be talking about, in some, in one, at one point in the paper, I, I got the sense almost as the apple pear as a kind of tribute project, uh, product. Um, and of course, tribute product from, uh, from and I, I work on China, by the way, I didn't mention that earlier, I don't work on Korea at all. Um, so a kind of late imperial Chinese type of tribute pro pro uh, product, whereby uh, localities throughout the empire uh, you know, uh, sought to uh, in increase the significance of their places uh, by ha getting their uh, their products kind of officially uh, labeled and so on uh, as as an imperial tribute. Um, and but of course, these kinds of tribute practice er practice actually continued uh, during the during state socialism uh, as well. So uh, I don't know if Professor David has something to say about that. Okay, on to uh, my second uh, kind of theme here, which is that of uh, self and other. So, um, so we start off with a classic in uh, kind of the anthropology of food, uh, city minces, sweetness and power. Another classic in the anthropology of food, which is kind of the bread and butter uh, of that of that discipline of that subdiscipline as well, is uh, Emiko Onuki Tiane's Rice's Self, right? Japanese identities uh, through time, which I think came out in 1992 or 1993, um, and she argues that products that symbols, food symbols, are not only uh, they're, they're products of history, but they're made in particular contexts of self-other interactions and comparisons and contrasts. So rice, uh, as she argues, uh, as kind of uh, as a symbol of Japanese selfhood, actually means does it in different ways in different contexts at different times, depending on who the relevant other is. Um, so the same possibly might be said about Korean kimchi, right? So its meanings appear to shift in relation to Japan, fermented, not fermented, for example, mild, spicy, to China, maybe pure, impure, uh, in terms of the North and the South. So here we see how regional differences and also differences of history, which of course also constitute or co tend to constitute shifts in uh, food, uh, everyday food practices, are downplayed uh, in favor of a common culture vis-a-vis -vis others, right, vis-a-vis -vis non-Korean others. Um, or, of course, in diasporic contexts in relation, for example, to dominant cultures or to other uh, diasporic groups. Uh, similarly, uh, kimchi and its Koreanness clearly mean different things for Japanese who have now domesticated it, um, or for that matter, for people like British foodies of non-Korean descent who have also taken it to heart and have started making their own versions of kimchi as well. And I, I received a, a British version of kimchi as a gift for my students last year, which, I, uh, which is actually very tasty, but only for, in certain, for certain things. Anyway, um, and let's not forget uh, China, uh, as Professor De Witt would no doubt uh, uh, remind us. Uh, so China is discussed in a couple of these papers as a producer of kimchi, but of course it's also a massive consumer of kimchi, um, both in terms of the Korean Chinese uh, minority there, and but also the long-standing influence of that minority on surrounding groups. It is everyday food in much of Northeast China, and I'm not entirely sure where the kind of distinctions between uh, different forms, of, b between, you know, Hangul, Pao Cai, and Pao Cai, and Suan Cai, and all these things actually, you know, these different versions of, 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 of uh, um, fermented cabbage, how clearly they always, uh, how clear the boundaries are when they're, when they're drawn and when they're not drawn, for example. Um, and, and of course, uh, you, you know, this is then, uh, takes on new meaning because of course the Hallyu effect is massive in China, uh, perhaps more, greater in China than maybe anywhere else in the world, perhaps. Um, okay, so, uh, but what I think what we find here also then is a kind of complexity in these papers that wasn't really in Onuki Tiane's original work on this, on this, on this topic, um, which is really, which is brought out in, that, in these papers, is that, you know, there's kind of these ordinary people and state actors are now navigating multiple mobile self-other relationships in a variety of contexts, um, and, for, and standing from a variety of different kinds of perspectives and positions. So there's simply lots and lots and lots of discourse on kimchi and other similar foods. There's kind of a surfeit of, of, of meaning and symbolism um, around kimchi. 
So for all the attempts by legitimating authorities, South and North Korean governments, uh, via UNESCO, uh, to pin down a definition of Korean uh, kimchi, these multiple discussions and discourses and contexts around kimchi, and of course this conference is part of that as well, um, may be having the rather ironic effect of while perhaps strengthening an apparently essential connection between kimchi and Koreanness in some sense, but at the same time destabilizing any unified sense of what, sense of what kimchi really is and perhaps also of what Koreanness really is. Um, when it comes to the apple pear as well, we can think about the way in which it's situated in a very interesting and, 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 and complicated way between Koreanness uh, and Chineseness. It's possible as that, that it might be the basis for claims uh, to a unique identity uh, between the two, um, as Professor DeWitt was, was talking about, but perhaps also alternative claims to identity could be made through the apple pear. Um, and I'd like to hear about that. Um, finally then, and I will be uh, maybe another three minutes or so in my comments, um, to talk about then uh, f food and symbolism in relation to materialities. So the kinds of Marxist and structuralist traditions that Sidney Mintz and Anouki Tierney respectively were building on uh, were perhaps in some ways, we can argue about that but it doesn't really matter, but somewhat limited in their attention to the material properties of foods, although Mintz has some wonderful things to say about that. Um, so foods may have actually their own kind of power, uh, not least in collaborative relationships with other, with other humans and other non-human actors, uh, shaping the ways in which they may be appropriated and used as symbols. And uh, I think Professor Yang Im implies as much in her very intriguing suggestion that we might think of kimchi as its own diaspora. I was, I was quite intrigued by that. Um, and so let me just highlight, uh, uh, to, to conclude, three dimensions of kimchi materiality, uh, which are touched on in all of these papers but might be elaborated on further. Uh, first of all, we have the element of taste and smell, right? Um, and it's the, the important part of taste, smell, and its connections to episodic memory and identity, as the anthropologist David Sutton has written about in particular. Um, and we can go on with this in particular in relation to kimchi, talking about how the fragrance to some pungency to others of kimchi may actually shape how people interact with it and with the meanings that can be given to it. So it has the capacity to unite and to divide along various lines. So to like it, right, might be seen as a kind of process or a test perhaps of Koreanness in some contexts. I was thinking there a good comparison um, so one of my native countries is Sweden, so a good comparison to that is the famous Sjöströmming, uh, which is um, uh, uh, fermented uh, herrings, uh, which are often considered one of the smelliest and most repugnant foods in the world. But these, uh, which I really disagree with, I love it, but, but my, my, my wife hates it. Um, and so which really, the features of this food shape the way it has, has become a particular marker of regional identity, working class identity, rurality, and masculinity, and sometimes, in some cases, with somewhat chauvinistic implications as well, I should add. Um, okay, secondly, another aspect of materiality is what we might think about as shared substance, consubstantiality, as Morris Bloch uh, wrote, uh, and, and people like Janet Karsten and Arjuna Padurai have also used that term. So, Certain foods have a, really seem to have a particular role in different cultures of producing relationships through physical acts of shared eating. So we can think about cooked rice as being especially essential to the creation of kinship as a kind of the substance of kinship itself uh, in Malay contexts and of course in many, many other parts of, of East and Southeast Asia as Janet Carson has written about. Um, so what role does kimchi play then in, uh, for example, as substance shared, right? Or what role does, does, uh, does uh, do the apple pear, does the apple pear play as substance shared? How do we situate these, uh, these foods as particular kinds of shared substances in relation or combination to others? For example, the role in gift exchange or the role that they ha might have in, 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 in eating rice, for example. Uh, so these kinds of things. And finally, um, there's the materiality of actually making things and growing things together. 
So skilled labor is an important dimension which is brought out and also brought in earlier papers today. The kind of multi-sensory interplay between makers of food and the food itself and between making, people making food together. Uh, and the way this fixes people or can fix in some sense people to agricultural cycles, to uh, gender relationships, to intergener intergenerational relationships, and through these to particular kinds of places as well, right? to claims in particular places. And it's really interesting in the UNESCO case that what they focus on, what ultimately becomes focused on, is the act of kimchi making, kimjang, not actually the food itself, which is of course linked to this idea of intangible cultural heritage. It has to be abstract in some sense, but it's actually a very material as well, right? Um, is what I want to emphasize here. Um, and, and, and kind of, you know, and there's a, there can be a very acute sense of loss um, of attachment if these kinds of skills and these shared practices are lost or diminished. Um, but we can ask ourselves, in, like, so what, what kinds of places does this fixed relationships do? Is it only to geographic Korea? Or, or, or can we also think about this in relation to home building practices in the diaspora? Um, uh, can we think about, you know, are there, do we see instances of, of, of material practices of making kimchi in new places? Or actually, through shared eating of kimchi might also uh, invoke uh, those kinds of uh, memories. So for example, to go back to David Sutton again, you know, the way that taste and can invoke memories of, 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 of episodes. So even maybe eating industrial kimchi made in kimchi may trigger memories of having shared, uh, you know, a, a, a kimchi making in Korea in one's childhood, for example. And this might be an aspect of what Zhang, in her written version of the paper, talks about as the joy and hope of kimchi in diaspora. Um, and finally, with, uh, to, with, uh, in relation to David's paper, um, we can think about how the, you know, how are the organic, organoelectric properties, the particular kind of taste smell of the apple pear, how are these evoked um, and, and when, it, when, used, when it's used as a symbol. Um, and we could, finally, we could also think about its the materiality of the apple pear in relation to the planting and growing of apple pear trees. Trees are really important throughout North China and other parts of the world as well in terms of establishing rights in land. Um, and there may be something going on there as well, which is very interesting, particularly in, what, in relation to what he was talking about at the end of his paper. Uh, so thank you very much. I will uh, finish my comments there and hand over to uh, each of the speakers. I don't know who wants to begin. I can, I can I can start. I can. Is that okay? Can I? That's great. Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of a uh, feedback on my uh, voice. Well, Jacob, thank you so much. This has this is a really inspiring and fascinating comment, and I find it there's a, so many interesting clues that I can actually I should delve into. But one thing that you mentioned, which is um, kimchi's domestication in Japan. Can that be understood as uh, in parallel to eating others, such as uh, as mentioned by Bell Hooks? That is just really, really interesting. You know, possibly, 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 but um, there may be different kind of um, reading. Uh, Kimchi-related slurs <laughs> in Japanese, there are a lot of them. A lot mm. of them. When Koreans in Japan were um, called smelly, it was always in relate reference to kimchi, almost specifically garlic, because garlic was not part of Japanese everyday diet for until recently. And then similar to kimchi, if you go to Chinese restaurant and if you ate gyoza, uh, the dumplings, it's actually typically fried, it uses a lot of garlic, and that became a big problem. If um, you, your office workers, and if you if you have a quick lunch outside of your office, you try not to eat gyoza because then if you return to office after lunch, you're gonna smell. Um, if you look at the uh, net internet right wingers that that uh, that throw slurs at Koreans today, Koreans in Japan today, they may call Koreans in Japan pigs or <laughs> all other names, but they actually no longer say they smell like garlic hmm. because garlic has become such a part of Japanese diet. <laughs> and so the globalization of food actually changed 
the way racial slurs are uh, thrown at the other. This, the, 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 I, I call it racial slur intentionally because when someone is insulted upon by using that someone else, that, that your own food, the food that your mother cooks, that your grandmother cooked, and that you ate, you eat with your family, and then outside of the family, other ethnic people, other ethnicity people of other ethnicity insult you based on that food. There is visceral, something visceral, right? It's it's almost like a racial slur because it's touching upon part of you that is protected part, that is unchangeable part, that is so in some ways essential that you you just so closely identify yourself with, such as skin color, eye color, hair color. So I I found um, you know the the. It's it's a little passe, of course. Now, now no longer Japanese would insult Koreans by using kimchi. But if you go back a little bit, a couple of decades, maybe three or four decades, then you'll find um, almost really racializing slurs in by involving kimchi. So, so seen from that, and then the jump to the current Japanese dietary, um, you know, this adventurousness of uh, diverse eating, including kimchi and making kimchi you know, rank up the top, one of the top items uh, of in terms of popularity, which is actually amazing. And it's, it, yes, you're right. I, I still don't, I mean, of course there are, you know, the usual suspects such as Hallyu, like uh, Kandu, you know, the, the, the Korean waves and all other popular things came to Japan and Japanese now go to Korea in huge groups, well, not during COVID, but you know, they're in in as of, in terms of tourist groups, and they even do pilgrimage visits to your favorite movie stars, home, you know, hometown, and so on. These things were pretty unthinkable. So kimchi, perhaps you know, domestication of kimchi is part of this big process. Um, but that's general. But in particular, I think there is. If it would be very interesting um, to think about the way kimchi appears and disappears in Japanese racial slurs against Koreans. And what is the relationship with kimchi and racism? Is there any? That would be an interesting thing to look at. I think you inspired me to, to think about it. I, I'm going to yield the floor so other panelists. Fantastic. Also. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, who would like to go next? Professor David, perhaps? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I can. Um, I would like to um, tack on to what you said about power and meaning and uh, the idea that maybe the apple pear, instead of only creating some sort of uh, debate about Koreanness and Chineseness, may also yield something else. And that is indeed true because um, uh, the apple pear is mostly grown in Yambian, where most of the ethnic Koreans are living. And uh, what I have observed is that uh, those intellectuals, the professors and the people from Yambian, they really create a social hierarchy versus uh, the non-Yambian people. And that is indeed also actually being discussed uh, when uh, non-Yambian people start to enter the debate about Koreanness and Chineseness and uh, the, the diasporic identity. Um, and um, that uh, they accuse the the Yambian intellectuals of, of creating a social hierarchy and then uh, abusing uh, the apple pear for this because the apple pear is only growing there and uh, we cannot compete with this so this is an unfair power relation that they are creating and uh, yeah, that is something I I, I should write uh, a bit better in uh, in my paper because that is a dynamic that uh, yeah there's not only uh, well um, discuss like this this Han Chinese versus Korean Chinese. Uh, dynamic, but uh, it also creates uh, like this inter-Korean Chinese uh, hierarchies that uh, are certainly there, but are indeed often not discussed when, when you talk about the food and how it pertains to a, a kind of like an essentialized ethnic identity, uh, which in the case of the apple pear, then you can see this is not essentialized at all because there's immediately a debate about uh, how this does not yield uh, the desired results for the Korean Chinese themselves. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that comment that uh, helps me think a bit more of on how to situate my paper and uh, write it a bit better. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you so much. That's great. Yeah. Chiyun, do you want to? Sure. Um, I so appreciate you um, pinpointing out the term ownership as possibly problematic in this situation. Um, and I think the 
I do think that by having UNESCO inscription, mm -hmm. you are claiming some type of authority over a social practice. And I know that it can be co-opted and used in different ways by other people and kind of jumping into that sphere. But I also think that by saying, because these nominations are tied to the specific member states, mm -hmm. that it's not just a kind of global comments, it still originates from one nation state. Well, this case, a dual inscription, mm. so both Koreas. So I think it shows by having it as a dual inscription, it has more of a power mm. of saying this is actually a shared, unified Korean cultural heritage, not just coming from years and years of South Korea, trying to kind of make the claims that we are the sovereign kimchi nation because that's been kind of that uh, language that's been used by the South mm. Korean government saying um, with challenges from China and also from Japan, it's still ongoing. This kimchi, who owns kimchi is still <laughs> um, a debate within the East Asian culinary context or politics even. And uh, recently the Korean government announced that in China, instead of pao chai or other names, they're going to uh, encourage Chinese, when referring to kimchi in China, um, that it's called xinqi. Mm. So they mm. just created a, based out of Chinese characters, but mm. so that they can really differ differentiate um, and kind of s still guard and defend kimchi as um, a national dish. Mm. So I think ownership, it is a little bit problematic, but I do think that when we're thinking about governments mm. as the main actors of these top-down um, gastro-national efforts, mm. we have to kind of, I guess my use of ownership was kind of coming from that angle mm. of wanting to portray the government as really feeling the need to address these perceived threats. Um, as people encroaching upon. Um, it's not something that they want to share mm. <laughs> um, and just want to really protect. Mm. And another thing I wanted to say is it took me by surprise too, um, focusing on UNESCO as a positive mm. <laughs> way. Um, I didn't expect my paper to go there and because prior research, I've been very critical of um, the heritageization process associated with the UNESCO um, kind of uh, work and it took me by surprise too because I entered it from a diplomacy mm. from international relations perspective mm. which was my kind of undergrad training so kind of putting my international relations hat on I was like oh wait this is actually a very interesting um, case because most of the scholarship that's been coming out about intangible cultural heritage or UNESCO has been very critical and kind of saying that this actually creates more tension and conflict and it seems like in the inter-Korean sphere, the mm. relations, there is a glimmer of hope that there could be something that could work, mm. be worked towards for achieving reconciliation. Mm. So, mm. I mean, I might be completely wrong, especially with the escalation of things on the peninsula, but I was surprised too. Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. Thank you so much. So we, st we do have some time still. Uh, so let's open it up to the floor. Uh, questions? Yes. There. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for your presentation. They were really, really interesting. And um, I wanted to ask a question to all the three presenters and uh, who want to reply to it is free to do that, of course. <laughs> and I was just thinking of pizza in Italy and kimchi as two symbols of identity, both for Korean people as well as for Italian people, as I am Italian. And I was thinking about how there is no uh, specific rules to do pizza in the world as for kimchi, which was registered actually. And uh, as an Italian, we do not fear reproductions of pizza in different ways such as pineapple pizza, <laughs> which is something we usually don't eat in Italy, or durian pizza, which I actually ate in China because I love durian, so I enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, I was thinking why Korean government is so obsessed with that, because I think that for pizza, the um, uh, very useful and successful, um, um, how to say, 
policy or action made by the government, uh, the Italian government, was not to act in the global sphere, but just let it spread and differentiate in each place because when something is uh, um, repro uh, reproduced in different ways, it actually becomes even more popular. And then people will, <laughs> in some ways, get interested more in that thing. And they will come to Naples after tasting many different pizzas all around the world and saying, okay, then I got the authentic pizza in Naples after my whole life. <laughs> And so I was thinking that maybe another um, um, mentality for Korean government could be uh, let it be that there will be Chinese kimchi, Japanese kimchi, and uh, Korean kimchi, Italian kimchi as well, uh, because in this way, kimchi is going to spread all over the world and just become even more famous. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Who would like to take that uh, first? Um, may uh, I? Dr. Kim, yeah. Um, I'm loving that you're kind of giving us a different spectrum of what globalization of food could be. One could be very tightly controlled and the other could be more of an organic kind of process. But isn't it that um, Neapolitan pizza is registered and kind of with the support of the government as well? So there's mm. already a standard to which the the, the localized versions can compete or compare. For kimchi, I think, um, A, I think, um, there's just been so much interest from the top down level to protect kimchi because it, it's kind of like the, the concept of fueling, right? Mm. Like what does kimchi fuel in Koreans, right? And I think it's this intense, intense um, source of cultural intimacy where um, Michael Herzfeld talks about this cultural intimacy where it kind of um, repulses other people um, outside of the community or the group, but it pulls together people um, within to kind of create solidarity. And it's kimchi is one of those things because you can either love it or you can hate it. Um, so I think when it comes to pizza, it's more universally appealing. There's not that many um, ingredients that go in that kind of, or the sensorial properties of consuming it that uh, elicits a disgust response. But because there's been so much negativity towards how people perceive kimchi throughout the years, um, f for almost a century where uh, uh, Dr. Rang was talking about racial slurs, right? A lot of the racial slurs that are connected to Koreans are of, you know, you smell like kimchi or, you know, there's a lot of negative association to that. So I think the government really wants to protect kimchi against um, Japan and China um, because of that and also because of the colonial history. So anything, uh, because Korea seems to have a harder time to differentiate itself on the global stage. It's always overshadowed by China and Japan. So kimchi is like one thing that the government thought would be undisputable, but of course everything is disputable. Um, so I think there's a little bit of um, opportunity to kind of do those comparisons, but I do think that pizza is a global food because it's very flexible. Whereas I don't know if we would er agree that kimchi is a global food. Um, I mean, maybe pibimbap is because the components are very flexible and you can add and take away as much as you want and it doesn't really elicit a disgust response. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a difference there. Sonia, do you want to add to that or maybe we should take some more questions and then, what do you think? Oh. Uh, yes, please take some more questions because I don't really have much to add. Save for us, uh, except for saying that, um, I, I would agree with Ji Hoon that the, um, the, I mean, to begin with, I don't know why governments want to make all these, you know, ownerships on pizza or kimchi or why do they even do that? I don't know. Except for maybe they want to make money out of it. Maybe it's a part of global capitalism. I don't know. But um, kimchi, the codex 
incident was definitely triggered by Japanese uh, producers trying to sell kimuchi in um, trying to register that as one of the, the official food items of the Atlantic, no, Atlanta Olympic Games. So that really was met with a huge um, reaction on the part of the Korean government. Um, I don't know, that could be, that might even reflect some domestic uh, politics because you know that uh, terrible, terrible uh, stampede in Itaewon, um, when that was gonna, that, that critique was gonna be directed to the government and thankfully, luckily for South Korean government, North Korea shot 23 missiles. So now everything is, is becoming towards that, you know, the, the, the emergency. So I'm not sure if there may have been some kind of domestic issues that would have been served by riling people up against Japanese movement move. I, you know, to 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 encode kimuchi as um, official food. I'm not sure. I haven't done the uh, you know, well enough research on that. Do you have more questions? Yeah, we have a question here. Yeah. It's less like a question, but it's really glad to hear these discussions. I'm an archaeologist, but cultural heritage is a big part of pain and <laughs> discussion in archaeology too. Um, I think this discussion of cultural heritage, kimchi or sagabe, um, both really cannot be thought beyond, um, should be thought as a part of colonialism heritage, a legacy of colonialism and counter post-colonialism that often embedded in nationalism, at, which is equally problematic in East Asian, particularly in Korea. So um, I, he, I want to hear a little bit about um, from Dr. Sonia Liang and also all of you about how you frame, <laughs> in a way, both colonialistic and post-colonialistic uh, response and how can angle is a big topic, so we yes. cannot solve that today, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I mean, the, um, now people do talk about, I mean, we we often, a little, a little, um, older scholarship of the uh, post, you know, post-war historians tend to think that Korea became something new, and then both North and South Koreas were almost. There was a myth that they were successful in terms of purging Japanese elements because they hated Japan so much. They always knew, as if, as if Koreans always hated Japanese and as if Koreans always knew that Japan was not their own country. I don't think that's the case. And then more recent uh, historians, uh, historical scholarships, they're, they're much more careful, identifying lots of continuities and then some inconsistent um, discussions or discourses about chinirupa, like uh, you know, pro-Japanese elements, because <laughs> who was not pro-Japanese during colonial time, right? So um, it's... Um, so in that sense, yes, the kimchi related or kimchi nationalism, I have a strong suspicion that that is actually completely a personal, maybe rather recent creation, um, you know, reflecting all kinds of stakeholders' interests, but maybe not so much interest either. Maybe it is structural, maybe it was some kind of fluke or some kind of contingency that was created um, against a backdrop, backdrop of a huge popularity in, um, in the rise of K-pop, K, whatever genre. However, K the rise of K-pop itself is actually government project, which is very, not very well known, but compared to J-pop, K-pop is a government project in the sense that government officials recruit and they, they have, they do, it's a bit like a North Korean recruitment. If you look at North Korean, um, was it Moranbong or um, or Chonbo, all these, you know, the famous girl bands, you see that not only they are all pretty, but they look same, they look the similar, same height, same build, and in similar type. If you look at KAL um, flight attendants, they have same size, same height, they're all beautiful in the same way. Maybe alluding, they all go to the same plastic surgery, a surgeon, I don't know, but it's a, it's an un uncanny level of um, uh, kind of uniformity, just show, asserting that this is Korea, but I am, at the same time, I'm a big skeptic of the, um, you know, the the Korean essence or 
so and so's national essence. I don't I don't think something like that exists. If there is if if that exists, I still don't know where we'd all of identifying it or intellectually arguing about it because I don't know. That's that just doesn't seem to yield to any fruitful conversation in social scientific way. But still, um, it is true that, like I said, when people believe that this is our nation's essence, then in and of itself, that becomes a reality. It may not be true or truthful reflection of say objective truth, if there is such a thing again, but for that person, that is the truth that he or she lives in. So how do we actually approach that kind of national identity? You know, from that perspective, how do we approach this national identification of kimchi with something so-called Korean national essence? And as you, as as I can see from Chi Hoon's paper, it it's, it exists in both North and South Koreas. So this is a this is a kind of big question. But yes, I I do feel that we don't quite have language for it. We haven't quite mastered. Uh, tamed this uh, this phenomenon in kind of any you know, viable intellectual ways. There's, so there's a lot of work to do. Thank you. Uh, do either of the other speakers want to add anything to that particular question? Uh, yes, I would like to talk about the colonial and post-colonial attributes of the apple pear, if it's possible. Like the Fantastic. like we, we know when the apple pear was created, so there is a history, uh, archaeological evidence of this that in 1921 there's a farmer who brought uh, a pear tree uh, to, to Notugu, uh, which is near uh, also in Yembien. Um, but it, it also plays into uh, what uh, Jacob is interested in with this distributes uh, food actually because uh, during the colonial times the apple pear doesn't register uh, as being something interesting but then when uh, the Chinese take over and the Koreans, they find themselves in China and having to live uh, within the Chinese society, the only way they can legitimize themselves is to have something special. And then the apple pear really uh, plays an important role uh, and, and starts to attain this big significance that they attach to it. And that's why you find it in all the magazines up to the 1980s, uh, like always pictures of uh, the apple pear trees and uh, how they're uh, colorful in the spring and uh, how uh, women in Hanbok, like I showed in the picture, are, are picking the, the apple trees. So every September, October, uh, there is a picture in the magazines uh, that, that portrays this. And this really ties into that, right? That uh, the food becomes like uh, a very important uh, post-colonial <laughs> um, uh, marker for them to, to legitimize uh, why they are allowed to, to stay within China and not be thrown out. Like they add something special to the whole of Chinese society. Really interesting. Thank you so much. That was great. Uh, Dr. Kim, would you like to add something uh, as well? Very quickly. Um, the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage, the representative list that um, kimchi making was inscribed onto, uh, was a actually second attempt from South Korea. So the first attempt was the royal court cuisine of the Joseon dynasty, which failed. And then right after um, Japanese washoku was inscribed, um, that same year that uh, royal court cuisine was rejected. So the Korean government pivoted and submitted kim, kim jang as an alternative. So it, in a lot of the government kind of announcements of the failed nomination of royal court cuisine and the news that Japanese washoku was inscribed, it was framed as kind of a source of shame and how everyone had to do better <laughs> to make sure that this um, failed nomination, we had like the Korean government official said, you know, we have to learn from this and do a better job because the Japanese have been doing it. So we need to catch up and have our food culture be recognized by UNESCO too. So there's definite um, still lingering um, kind of tensions based off of this, this idea that you know we are still in competition um, and wanting to prove ourselves to our you know, former colonial master. Great, thank you so much. I'm afraid we have rather run out of time. Um, so if, please, if maybe if, if you still have some questions, maybe you could, uh, uh, you know, contact the uh, speakers later on. Uh, and uh, let's uh, finish by giving the speakers a huge round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
someone handed me a microphone, so I'm going to stand up here. Um, thank you all so much. This was <clears throat> an absolutely fantastic day. I'm so excited there's one more. Um, so thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, we are going to engage in a bit of a ritual and do a group photo. So I would like to ask just the panelists and discussants, um, of course, for both days. And very sorry to those of you who are online, but we'll remember that you were here. Um, <laughs> so do, do feel free to take a few minutes if anyone needs to make a run somewhere. Um, we'll slowly mill towards the front. Um, and to all of you who, who are not panelists and discussants, thank you again for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, and have a lovely evening.